Until Darwin, many scientists were in agreement with the biblical account that animals produce after their own kind. But as the evolutionary perspective was given more authority, scientists were under pressure to prove Darwin's hypothesis and explain how life forms could possibly have changed from one form into another. Now we are told that the way evolution proceeds is damages due to some outside influence like cosmic rays caused the cell to make mistakes. We call those mutations. And gradually one organism is supposed to have changed into another organism all the way from a single cell to invertebrates like clams or starfish and then the vertebrate fishes, the amphibia, the reptiles, birds, mammals, and finally man. And here we are now, the product of billions of mistakes. Scientists know the genetic code prevents one life form from changing into another kind. So they speculate that mutations or damages to the DNA must be responsible for evolutionary processes. Again, they believe this in spite of the observable evidence that no new species has ever resulted from a mutation. Mutations are almost always harmful. They can bring about small adjustments in a particular species but no way are they able to change one kind of creature into another. If evolution has really occurred, we ought to be able to see the evidence in the fossil record. After all, that's the record of the past. But if we look at that fossil record carefully, we see that there are no recorded instances of one type of an animal ever changing into another. There's no transitional forms. One of my advisors is uh, working in, in the field of paleontology and has been working on the uh, distribution of fossils in the record and has found that uh, there are no interspecific transitional forms, something that of course the creation model would have predicted and did predict long before this research was done. We ought to see cats and we ought to see dogs and we ought to see cogs and dats. We ought to see them in between. We ought not to be able to divide them like we are now. But that doesn't usually stop my evolutionary colleagues. They will make the statements over and over again that the, the fossil record is replete with these transitional forms. There are a myriad transitional forms. Uh, there's really no problem uh, finding transitional forms. It's completely false to say that there's a, a lacking of uh, transitional forms. We have plenty of them, more than sometimes we can cope with. In fact, there are so many transitional forms between species that we must often fall back on statistical analysis to separate one from the other. So the claim that there are no intermediates is simply a false claim. During their interviews, several of these prominent scientists contradicted themselves, admitting that no transitional forms had been found and proceeded to offer excuses for the lack of evidence. And the problem of transitional forms <coughs> is one that all honest uh, paleontologists have a problem with. The uh, geologic record is incomplete. Uh, it's incomplete because of erosion that has eroded things away. One of the things that uh, also uh, makes it a little more difficult in the fossil record is the rapidity with which uh, evolution acts in very s short bursts. Um, it doesn't leave many transitional forms behind. Let's go to the British Museum of Natural History to the man who wrote the book there on evolution, Dr. Colin Patterson. I wrote to Dr. Patterson and asked him why he didn't put a single picture of an intermediate form or a connecting link in his book on evolution. Dr. Patterson now, who has seven million fossils in his museum, said the following when he answered my letter, quote, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I certainly would have included them." Unquote. Later he said, I will lay it on the line. There is not one such fossil for which one might make a watertight argument. Since Darwin's time, Evolutionists have aggressively searched for vital fossil evidence to support the idea that life forms evolved. Even Darwin admitted that his own theory was worthless speculation without invaluable fossil proof for transitional forms. In collaboration with evolutionists, oil companies have drilled wells throughout the world, examining layers of the earth to depths in excess of five miles. Of the millions of fossils unearthed, not one sample of a transitional form has been discovered. 
Over the years, the research of geology and archaeology have also failed to produce evidence that supports evolution's claims. In Darwin's time, there was not a single example of anything that has come to be known as a missing link. In fact, it was not until almost the time of his death that a fossil bird was discovered in Bavaria, I believe. It was named Archaeopteryx that was, for all intents and purposes, intermediate between reptiles and birds. That was a triumph of his hypothesis. Archaeopteryx, classified today by many paleontologists as a true bird, not a reptile bird intermediary, was the first of a number of deceptive schemes promoting evolutionary ideas. Evolutionists misdated and misidentified this extinct bird, presuming it to be the missing link between reptiles and birds. The best example of a transitional form that my evolutionary friends usually give is Archaeopteryx, the supposed link between the reptiles and the birds. Recently, uh, another bird has been found dated by evolutionists to be 75 million years older than, than Archaeopteryx. So therefore, Archaeopteryx could certainly not be the ancestor of the birds. Actually, evolutionists don't have any idea how the reptiles evolved into birds. They don't have any of these transitional forms. But that doesn't stop them. You pick up any book on evolution, and Archaeopteryx is still presented as the best evidence. Archaeopteryx here is a good example of a transitional form because it shares characters which we ordinarily think of being typical either of birds or dinosaurs. Archaeopteryx is right halfway between, and it's for this reason that many of us are inclined to call birds reptiles. The next time you have a Thanksgiving dinner, you can, you can tell people that you're eating dinosaurs. Uh, reptiles are supposed to have converted their scales into feathers. Now, a scale in a reptile is nothing but a fold in the skin. Now, how in the world could a fold in the skin have ever been frayed out into the intricate design of a feather? There's never been anything found intermediate between the fold in the reptile skin and the feather of a bird. In the evolution of flying creatures, uh, an animal's forelimb, good for walking or climbing, must have gradually changed into a wing. We have never found any fossils that showed this in-between structure. I suspect that such a creature, long before he had a good wing, had a lousy forelimb, and he could neither have walked nor flown. The whole idea is ludicrous. Because no fossil records exist to confirm evolutionary assumptions, dubious artworks are relied upon and exhibited as fact. Misleading artistic interpretations depict fish magically growing legs and changing into amphibians. Extinct deer-like creatures mysteriously turning into horses and monkeys becoming humans. Where non-existent transitional skeletons are needed to prove a point, skilled craftsmen substitute plastic and wooden models. I'm very concerned about the way our museums present evolution as though it were a proven fact. And actually, false information is being presented. You see, since the museums don't have the transitional forms, they have to make them up out of thin air. The November 1980 edition of Science Digest shows a drawing of a whale with legs as an evolutionary link between whales and cows. But the only fossil evidence for this mythological transition is a skull and several teeth, no leg bones. Niles Eldridge at the American Museum said, you're only limited by the credulity of your audience and your own imagination in making up these stories of what changed into what and what the intermediate forms were. When asked to come up with evidence that evolution really has taken place, evolutionists will frequently bring up very minor changes in, in uh, living things, such as insects becoming resistant to DDT or insects changing color. Can we see evolution taking place today? You certainly can. We can. Um, one of the most spectacular examples, have you ever heard of the San Jose scale? San Jose scale is an insect that infects oranges. The thing has evolved to resist the pesticides that they were using on it. This is not evolution. Evolutionists should know better. These small changes are totally compatible with the creation understanding of things. What we need to see is major changes, some type of an animal changing into another type of an animal, and this we do not see. If we're talking about seeing evolution today, uh, seeing one species changing into another species, uh, that's not going to happen. Although there must be, from an evolutionary perspective, 
many transitional forms out there, the likelihood of finding any one of them is extremely low. The more we learn about paleontology, that is fossils, the more certain we are that evolution is based on faith alone. The National Academy of Science is the official advisor to the U.S. government on questions of science. In its publications, it falsely claims that the missing links that troubled Darwin are no longer missing. This is misrepresentation which deceives millions because after 120 years of exhaustive searching, Darwin's missing links are still missing. Yet this academy and evolutionists continue to perpetuate the mythical theory that man developed from ape-like creatures. Richard Leakey, who is one of the most uh, well-known anthropologist said that if he were asked to draw a family tree for man he would just have to draw a huge question mark because the evidence is too scanty to possibly know man's evolutionary origin and he didn't think we're ever going to find it to aid and abet evolutionary concepts artistic depictions have gone beyond ethical boundaries despite having no foundation for the ape to man theory Scientists and artists continue to dupe the public with lifelike but imaginary illustrations. These artists vainly entertain natural progressions of apes to humans and presume their hair color, skin tones, and even facial expressions from no more than a tooth, a piece of bone, or even no evidence at all. National Geographic magazine, which doesn't attempt to hide its evolutionary bias, admits that these fossilized footprints are identical to human footprints. Yet artists take the liberty to accommodate evolutionary theory and illustrate ape-like features to fit ape-like creatures. All because biased dating processes insist that these footprints were found in rock layers said to exist before humans. Now, today we have evolutionists who would like us to believe there is solid evidence for evolution. Before the public, they generally create the impression that the evidence is just like solid gold, that man has evolved from some ape-like creature. Dr. Donald Johansson, director of the Institute of Human Origins, discovered Lucy, an alleged ape-to-man missing link. The human family and the ape family diverged and went on their own individual and separate evolutionary trajectories. We don't know precisely the, the, what the common ancestor was for that, but we know that it resembles something like what is called Ramapithecus. Ramapithecus. That was formed out of nothing but a fragment of a jaw and several teeth. And for many, many years, Ramapithecus was held up as our ape-like ancestor. But now Dr. Pillbeam at the Yale Harvard Peabody Museum, when I interviewed him, he said, we have found about 40 of these creatures now, some of them fairly complete, and they are not on the direct line to becoming man at all. They're more like an orangutan. Dr. Pilbeam of Yale, who first claimed that Ramapithecus was an ancestor of man, now suggests that it isn't. Yet evolutionists continue to cite Ramapithecus as an ape-man link. Another so-called missing link, Java Man, was concocted by Eugene Dubois when he found an ape-like skull fragment and then 50 feet away, he found a human leg bone. However, just before he died, Dubois confessed that he'd also found two human skulls at this same location. And he admitted that the skull fragment belonged to a gibbon and not to an ape man. Homo erectus is probably best known as Java man. And it was at this stage in human evolution that they began to make and use these large triangular hand axes. Brains expanded over a thousand cc's. Uh, body proportions similar to ours evolved, and we were firmly on the road uh, to later hominids, including modern humans. This hoax is still accepted by evolutionists today, and it's presented to the public as a true missing link. If you think the Java Man hoax is incredible, wait until you hear all the facts surrounding Johansson's Lucy, this little three-and-a-half-foot adult skeleton, which looks just like a chimpanzee. Uh, as you know, Lucy was found in 1974, and sometimes I refer to her as the woman who shook up man's family tree, because she represents for us the oldest, most complete skeleton we have of any human ancestor known to anthropologists. Now, the species Australopithecus alfarensis, as represented by Lucy, is a species that we feel is ancestral to modern humans. 
And the significance of Lucy is that she gives us a good idea of what our ancestors looked like some three million years ago. We can learn from her skeleton about the way that she walked, for example. When we look at her knee joint, when we look at her pelvis, we see that she walked like you and I, and instead of like a chimpanzee. Johansson said, even though this is a very ape-like creature, it walked upright. Well, the pygmy chimp today wanders around in the rainforest walking upright almost all the time, so that doesn't prove anything. Actually, the only features of Lucy which even hint at erect posture are the knee and, and hip joints. Dr. Charles Oxnard, with a sophisticated computer analysis, has concluded that Johansson's claims for the hip are unfounded, and it must be pointed out that the knee was not even found with Lucy. This knee joint was found over a mile away, 200 feet deeper than the other bones. She comes closer to representing, I think, what the average person thinks of as the missing link than any other fossil we had, had ever found in Africa. So she has extraordinary importance in terms of understanding the very earliest phases of human evolution. Richard Leakey and others are now claiming that in all likelihood Lucy is really a mosaic of, of two or more species. This isn't funny. What is funny is that they claim that creation isn't scientific. Uh, the next thing back was Piltdown Man. Here was a case where a human skull had been doctored up along with a jaw of an orangutan to make the jaw look somewhat human. The teeth were filed. It turned out to be a pure fraud. Piltdown Man was a purposeful fraud and it fooled the world's greatest evolutionists simply because they so much wanted to believe that there was some evidence for evolution. Neanderthal Man was originally found in the Neanderthal Valley of Germany. These creatures almost all look very modern, but several of them, two or three, had a very stooped over, brutish appearance. Now, however, two scientists have gone over to the museums in Europe from Johns Hopkins University, got these bones out of the museums and x-rayed the ones that had a very stooped over appearance. And lo and behold, they discovered that the stooped over creatures had rickets or some vitamin D deficiency disease such as arthritis. They have reclassified the Neanderthals from a separate species, now put them back into Homo sapiens, the same as modern man. Now Nebraska man consisted of nothing but a single tooth. And around this single tooth, pictures were drawn showing an ape-like creature that had evolved into man. It turned out later that this tooth was nothing but the tooth of an extinct pig. And this is a case now where uh, a pig made a monkey out of an evolutionist. I think man has always been man. The scientific evidence shows this, and this, of course, is very consistent with the account of creation that is presented in the book of Genesis behind closed doors or occasionally when speaking very candidly the evolutionists admit there is really no evidence that man evolved from the apes. <laughs>